Hey, Good Shepherd, it's good to see you. I'm glad that you are joining. I'm glad that you're a part of these groups, uh, these groups, home groups, to fellowship with one another and to study. Thanks also for this past week. Uh, a few of you had sent suggestions to me on things that could change. Uh, those are really helpful. So going forward, uh, a couple things. One, yeah, this will be shorter than it was last week, and that's the intent moving forward. And secondly, because kids are with us, most likely uh, they're with you now watching this, I'll have a few uh, thoughts for them too at the very end. As we continue, uh, let's look at the first commandment, Exodus chapter 20. Last week we looked at the prelude, God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. One thing I want to follow up uh, with that I mentioned briefly last week is that this reference or this word for you in verse 2 is singular. In fact, what we will find in all of these commandments, you, that second person is singular. It's not plural. So it's not God speaking to a group of people. God is speaking to an individual. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. That is how God typically addresses his covenant people as, uh, as one. Uh, but I think moving forward as well, what we see is that God had said that he will rescue uh, his firstborn, his son, from Egypt. And so we see this collective group Israel referred to as the Son of God, which puts us even closer to Christ. And we see then in these commandments a Christological understanding, how they point to Christ, who is the true and the faithful Son of God. All of these commandments, he is the one who obeyed them to the point of death. This first commandment, beginning with verse 3, is a very short one. You shall have no other gods before me. And there's really a lot that could be said about verse three, this first commandment. Hopefully you uh, are able to spend some time in the catechisms, larger and shorter catechism, and I'll give you those numbers uh, at the end of this video. What I want to do is organize my thoughts uh, in three points, like a well-organized sermon. I want to look at what, what is this saying, why is it saying, and how is it that God's people uh, follow this? What is it saying, that first commandment? Well, notice this language, and if you have other translations, you might see a difference here. In the Hebrew, the ESV translates this word as before. Other translations might uh, translate it as in addition to. I'm not sure if there's, if there's a huge difference between the two, but I would say that I think this translation before me, you shall have no other gods before me, is probably more accurate. And what that does is it acknowledges that there are other gods. This is similar to what we see in Psalm 82, verse 1. Psalm 82, verse 1, as the Lord says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgments. So the first commandment acknowledges that there are other now, this translation could be supernatural beings. It could also sometimes in Scripture, Elohim, translated here as God, can also be translated as gods. But it could also be translated elsewhere as judges. The whole point is that Scripture acknowledges that there are other gods. And so the point of the command is that you should have no other gods before me, right? It prohibits the worship of other gods. Now, that might seem like a bit of a contradiction. Are there other gods? And yet, if there are other gods, obviously this commandment is don't worship other gods. But if there are no other gods, then why is this commandment here? One way, I think, to answer that 
question is through uh, the the definition or or, or through the, the the understanding of idolatry. Okay. We know that idols exist. John says that very clearly at the very end of his first letter when he's writing to the church, uh, stay away from idols, keep away from, from idols. He's acknowledging that there is something else in creation that we tend to love or something else or someone else that we tend to trust more than God. And so perhaps what this is saying to us is that the way of slavery is that way of idolatry, right? So God is saying, don't go back into that way. When we make uh, our own gods, when we find something that is more important to us than God himself, anything that captures our hearts and our imagination, our minds and our devotion, our adoration, right? That's idolatry. So that's the way of slavery. Don't go in that way. Instead, this is the God that you are to worship. And I think it helps remember the context. That comes through in the prelude or the prologue. The Lord had just rescued them and freed them from Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. He is the one who delivered them. Now he is the one to guide them. briefly is saying prohibition against other gods. He is the one who rescued us, who freed us. His way is the way of freedom. Second question is why? Why is this commandment here? Or why is this commandment first? And I think the answer is very simple. The first commandment, which is also the greatest commandment, makes it clear that God must come first. In fact, this first commandment makes it possible to keep the other commandments. As good as, for example, family is, as good as it is to have possessions, neither of those things first place in our hearts. And so this commandment is the first. It is the greatest because it is the means by which we can keep all the other commandments. But perhaps even more importantly, it makes it clear that God must come first. So what does this commandment teach briefly? Why is this commandment first? And lastly, how? How do we keep this commandment? Two answers. The first answer comes from Deuteronomy chapter 6, when we are told to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, with all of our mind. The emphasis in Deuteronomy 6 is all. We keep this commandment with our entire selves all parts of us. How else do we keep this commandment? When we move forward to the time of the new covenant, to the covenants of grace established fully in Christ, to the New Testament, what we find is what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that the Holy Spirit writes the law upon our hearts. Now, the external word, the word of God, Scripture, remains. The emphasis on the Holy Spirit writing the law on our hearts reminds us that we keep this law and we keep this commandment by the power of the Holy Spirit. The, that's the internal power of the Spirit. The external word, the, the written word, the Scripture, is how the Holy Spirit, the internal witness, leads us that we might know and love God. So the what, the why, and the how. As you spend time together, there's a couple things, a couple of scripture passages that you can look at. You can look, for example, at Joshua 24, 
the very end of Joshua, last book, last chapter in that book. Here we find a repetition of this same phrase, where Joshua makes it clear, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, why does he say that? Well, the temptation was to worship other gods before the one who had set them free. Not only were they free from Egypt, but now they're going into Canaan. So those temptations, Joshua is very aware, were going to come before God's people. The same point that we must choose to worship the Lord is the same point that the new Joshua, the greater Joshua, Jesus makes in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 where our Lord and our Savior says to us, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's impossible. So you can spend some time looking at Joshua 24, Matthew chapter 6. You can look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5. You can look at Romans chapter 1 verses 21 to 32. The catechisms, you could look at the shorter catechism, questions 45 to 48. You're going to find a lot more in the larger catechism, obviously, uh, in questions 103 to 106. There's a lot more there for us in the larger catechism. Let me conclude with a few questions. First, let me talk briefly to the kids and to the parents. Parents, kids, you could spend some time uh, with the basic What is the first commandment? See if they remember what the Lord instructs his people not to do. Uh, secondly, you can ask them uh, how, and by, how do we come to know about God, right? What is how many gods there are? And in how many persons does this one God exist? And if your children ask questions about um, the spirit of God in our hearts, that's a wonderful promise, right? The spirit of Christ lives in us. Jesus, who is ascended bodily, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, through his spirit, they are working in us to conform us to the image of Christ. And so what that means for kids, right? How do, I, how do I grow up in the Christ, right? How do I follow God? Well, one way is to keep listening to the word of God. Keep reading the word of God. With parents or with the adults, a few things that I want you to think about if you want to spend time considering them. One would be uh, the relation of this commandment to creation. How does this commandment uh, relate or broaden our understanding of the good gifts of creation. So what is that relationship? How are we to receive what God has created? Um, and lastly, we think of what does it mean for us to follow Christ? And I think the significance there is that this first commandment is a commandment of renunciation. It's a commandment that we are to renounce other gods. And so the path of holiness, the path of growing up into Christ, it might be understood as beginning with renunciation. And of course, as our confession teaches us, repentance is a daily activity, a whole lifelong activity. What's the significance of the path of holiness, this first commandment, teaching us to renounce. Now, a couple questions. You can spend some time looking at the catechisms. You can spend time looking at those scripture passages, spend time uh, thinking about these questions. Perhaps you would also, hopefully, uh, not only studying, uh, praying, remember to pray with one another, but lastly, also to sing. And one hymn in particular that uh, came to my attention while looking at this one is Luther's A Mighty Fortress. That is in our Trinity Hymnal number 92. So perhaps that could be one of the hymns that you would spend time singing together as gospel.
God bless you. And I pray that this would be edifying to you and that the church uh, would continue to walk in holiness to the glory of Christ. Amen.